everyone. I uh, just want to give you a warm welcome to our service today and especially those who are visiting here very often here this morning. And a very special welcome to the Reverend Stuart Finley, Minister Emeritus to the Bond of the Long Presbyterian Church. Stuart, we greatly, we greatly appreciate your teaching and Bible study during the vacancy and look forward to the message you will bring to us today. There are a few announcements. Uh, our pre communion service will be this evening at 7 o'clock. The speaker will be Mr. Henry McCauley from North Presbyterian Church. We encourage a good attendance as we prepare for communion next Sunday. Our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting will be held on Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock. All will be made very welcome as we study God's word and pray for the many needs of our congregation and world. A taking care of training night will take place here in Dalaroni on Wednesday, the 17th of May at 7.30 p.m. It is important that all leaders in all organizations attend this training night so that we will be fully covered from uh, September. This training will cover, cover us for three years and there's a, there's a sheet out in the best of you if everybody that is attending that can sign that. The Reverend Andrew Borland wishes to thank <coughs> Session Committee and Congregation for the generous gift and kind words on his final Sunday as vacancy convener and assures us of his continuing prayers during our vacancy. Next Sunday, our, uh, our Sunday school and young teens will meet as usual at 11. The prayer meeting also meet at 11. The service is live streamed in the back room here each Sunday for anybody who wants to avail of that. Our Sunday service next week will <coughs> Uh, we, will, we will celebrate communion and it will be taken by the Reverend John Noble. Uh, that's all the announcements. Just hand over to you, Stuart. Thank you very much for your words of welcome and good morning to you all. The sun is shining in Valley Valleyroni this morning, which is lovely to see. Although it was a pretty murky morning when I was coming across uh, the mountains earlier on. Last time I was here, I believe, was in John Lockington's time, so not many of you will remember that, and I don't expect any of you to remember me being here way back then, but that's over 40 years ago. Anyway, there you are. Such is life. Glad to be with you uh, today. I'm normally taking services in Warren Point on a Sunday morning, uh, but I had this morning off, so I thought, what else could I do but come and take services in Drumlee and Ballyroney, so here I am today. Lovely to be uh, sharing with you. And of course it is the most important thing that we can ever do uh, during the week. The most important thing we do on the first day of the week, we worship the God who made us and loves us and provides for us. And in our opening item of praise, we're uh, reminding ourselves of the importance of Jesus to us. Uh, these, the words of the, the piece we're going to sing are based on some words of the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, where he's talking about how he was willing to give up everything for the sake of knowing Christ and this particular piece follows that all I once held dear.
Before we pray together, let me read some words from Hebrews chapter 11. Words will be familiar to some of you. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So let's unite together in prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> our Lord and our God, we thank you that we're able to join together in this meeting house today to worship you, the God of heaven and earth. We've just been reading that without faith it is impossible to please you. And so we thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you for the ability, the capacity we have in our hearts and minds to know that there is a God. And we do believe that you exist. Without faith, it is impossible to know you. But we do believe that you exist. You're the creator of everything that we see around us. The, the wonder of the mountains, the majestic mountains and, and the seas and the rivers and the valleys and the fields and the flowers and our gardens. You've made everything. You've revealed yourself through your works of creation. And you've revealed yourself through your word. We thank you for the Bible and for the fact that we're able to read there and know more about you. And we thank you that you've revealed yourself especially through Jesus the one that you've given into the world to be our saviour. We thank you that he is the son of God incarnate, that knowing him, we know you. And we've been reading that we must believe that you reward those who earnestly seek you. And we're here today to seek you, Lord, earnestly. We need your blessing on our lives. We need your forgiveness. And so we come confessing our sins of thought and word and deed, things that we've done during the past week that would make us feel ashamed, the guilt that we feel for things undone that we should have done. We come earnestly seeking your forgiveness today, looking to you through Jesus to forgive our sins and to give us that peace with God that we need. We come seeking your word through the Bible as we read from it, we we thank you that it is your unchanging truth. And we come seeking the, the Holy Spirit to, that he might come and help us to worship you from our hearts, that he might help us in our understanding of the reading of Scripture. We come earnestly, Lord, desiring to know your blessing on us as individuals, upon our families, upon our communities. And as we come, we come thanking you for all the blessings of the past week, for every good gift that comes from your hand. Thanking you for this day, for this place of worship, for this gathering of your people. So come, Lord, by your Spirit, and bless each of us as we earnestly seek you now. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, for our Bible reading this morning, we're turning to John's Gospel, uh, chapter 6. I think it's page 1070 in your pew Bible. Yes, 1070. We're going to read from verse 25 through to verse 40. Uh, this is the chapter in John's Gospel where we read about uh, the feeding of the 5,000. And after that, Jesus walking on the water across the Sea of Galilee. And then we pick up the story uh, at verse 25. Uh, the people have been looking for Jesus as he crossed over uh, the lake. So verse 25, we remind ourselves this is the word of God that we read and hear. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our fathers, forefathers, ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, 
It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And we know the Lord will bless his word to our hearts. Uh, boys and girls, I'm going to come down to the front, so if you want to come and meet me there, I'll be down in just a second. I think we've got some more coming from upstairs. We have indeed. Find a place to sit. Good. Oh, Very good. Lovely to see you all here this morning. You've got a day off school tomorrow, so that's something to be very thankful for, is it not? I see a few smiles. Good. Do you know something? The teachers enjoy holidays even more than the children do. That is the truth. Anyway, um, do you like bread? all like bread of, of different sorts. Well, I like bread, and I've brought some bread with me here. Let me just uh, set this down for a minute. Um, tell me, do you like white bread? Yeah. yeah, okay. Or would you prefer brown bread? No. Why is that? It was the same in Drumlee. Nobody liked the brown bread. Everybody likes the white bread. Anyway, square bread. Anybody like round bread? Well, what I mean is, I'm calling this round bread. What is this? Yeah, it's a bab. That's what I would call it. Or some people call it a roll. Do you like eating rolls? Do you, do you ever have soup and dip the bread of your roll into the soup? Yeah, you do something like that. Right, round bread. Does anybody like uh, triangular bread? Do you know what sort of bread this is? Yeah? Soda bread. Soda bread. Do you like soda bread? Yeah, I like soda bread. I like it with peanut butter on it. Isn't that a strange thing? Does anybody like peanut butter? Yeah, some people. Okay, right. And what else? Oh, yes. Uh, do you know what this is? Of course you'll recognize that. What is it? Breadstick. Do you like breadsticks? Yeah. yeah, very popular in our house too. Breadsticks. I think they constitute bread. Breadsticks. All different sorts of bread. I like bread just as bread with butter and jam on it. Or peanut butter on. Do you like toast? Do you like marmalade on your toast? Not many people like marmalade on their toast. Okay. Do you like toasted sandwiches? Yeah. Do you like, uh, what else? Do you like burgers with the, the bap? Yeah. yeah, you like that sort of bap. Uh, what else? Do you like bread and butter pudding? Have you ever had bread and butter pudding? No. Some people are looking a bit pot. Do they have a, ever have bread and butter pudding in your houses? Well, one or two of you do. Good. Well, listen, boys and girls, bread and butter pudding is really lovely. And when you go home, you say to mommy or daddy, whoever does the cooking at home, can we have bread and butter pudding sometime? Because it's a really lovely dessert to have after your Sunday dinner. Anyway, that's by the by. Bread, it's so very important. Do you like stuffing with your chicken or your turkey? Breads and stuffing. Bread is so important to us. It always has been important. Going back thousands of years, bread was the most important thing that people used to eat. Before there were supermarkets and shops to go to, people used to bake bread every day or every week, and that was the main thing they ate. Bread filled their tummies when they were hungry. It was so very important, and still is important 
in many places today as well. Now this morning we've already read about something that Jesus said. He said that he was the bread of life. And he meant by that that he's the one who can fill not an empty tummy, but he's the one who can fill the emptiness that's in our hearts and lives for God. Because that's how we know God, through Jesus. And when we have Jesus in our life, then he meets that hunger that we have for God. And that's the most important thing of all. There are some other kind of bits of bread that I have here, but I don't think they look... Do you know what those are? What kind of bread is that? You, you, fake bread, isn't it? It's like toy bread, something you play with. So it's, it wouldn't be very good to, to eat and to fill your tummy. And you know, the temptation for us all is that there are a whole lot of things out there in the world that we can fill our lives with. We can fill our lives with games and playing and our friends and television and computers and school and studies and work and all sorts of things. And while those things are good and helpful, they do not meet the hunger that we have in our hearts for God. We need God and we meet God through Jesus. That's why it's so important that we learn about Jesus in Sunday school and school and at home and all sorts of places. Important to learn about Jesus and to learn about how he can meet that emptiness that we have in our hearts for God. Jesus is our bread of life. Next time you're having some bread, it might be toast or it might be a sandwich or who knows, next time you remember who Jesus is and what he said, I am the bread of life. Thank you very much. You've listened so very well, answered well. Do you want to go back to your places? And I'll pack up my bread here because I might not get anything to eat. Lunchtime, I didn't have this with me. Well, now we're going to sing uh, with boys and girls him, and it's this lovely piece that reminds us that Jesus is strong and kind. And it says in the words of this, this lovely piece, I shall come to him, he will satisfy me, meet my need for God, he'll be with me in times when I'm afraid, he'll be there all the time, he can even, when I'm lost, bring me home. So it's a, it's a lovely little piece that we're singing, not only for the boys and girls, but for all of us, Jesus, strong and kind. Jesus Christ. 
Well, in our prayers of intercession, I want to pick up on some of the uh, prayer points that come through from uh, assembly buildings every week for congregations like yours. Um, and I want to pick out some uh, prayer requests for congregations in the Republic of Ireland. Um, first of all, Dundalk. Some of you will have travelled through Dundalk at times. Um, the church has, has grown there over the past number of years. And at the moment, they're planning for a Christianity Explored course for people who are interested in thinking about what it means to be a Christian. And they're also planning their, uh, their children's holiday Bible club, like a lot of other congregations. So they've asked us to pray for them. Philip Welton is an Irish mission worker down in Arklow, south of Dublin. Um, this is what he says. Give thanks for the many opportunities to share the gospel through various activities through the week. Pray for the children who have registered again for the Holiday Bible Club in August and for all the leaders who volunteer for this important week uh, for the church and community. And then we're also asked to pray for two little congregations, Ennis Gorthy and Wexford. Um, you're a vacant congregations. They're vacant also. They have 12 families in Ennis Gorthy and seven families in Wexford. Now think about that. Um, that mustn't be easy to keep things going in those little congregations. Their future is very uncertain because it looks like something's going to have to happen to combine them with, with other churches. So in the meantime, those little groups of faithful people are meeting week by week for worship and they've, they've asked us to pray for them uh, and for God's guidance uh, in the times ahead. Kenny Hanna, you will know about, uh, uh, the rural chaplain. I'm sure he's been here uh, in the past. He has his hotel Bible study in Hilltown twice a, twice a month, first and third Thursdays of the month. He always asks us to pray about that. You may also have heard that Seamus Burke is now organizing Bible studies in Mayo Bridge uh, on the first and third Tuesdays of the month. Um, it's got off to an encouraging start, he, he says. There are about seven people from different backgrounds meeting for that Bible study in Mayo Bridge. So that's very much of a first uh, happening there. And so we're asked to remember both those outreaches uh, that are taking place uh, twice a month. I always like to remember the persecuted church. And whenever I'm conducting worship somewhere, open doors, prayer material, yesterday and the day before, we're focusing on Mexico. Um, you may wonder, like me, why is the church persecuted in Mexico? It's something like 95% Christian. Uh, yet it, it's the drug um, barons, the, the gangs who run, run a lot of Mexico. And they're very much against the church because the church stands out against them. Their, their violence and their drug taking and promotion of drugs. And the church stands out against, speaks against them. And so the church leaders are targeted because of that reason. And so... It is true that in, in Mexico, where there are a lot of Christian people, nonetheless, there is this difficulty. And, and one of the, the pastors says this, actually, when you respond to persecution appropriately, you can win the community to Christ. He's seen locals from his own community, even his persecutors, soften towards him after he resisted the, the, the temptation to retaliate. Pray that this testimony will be replicated across Mexico, leading to people coming to know Jesus. Mexico. And then we've been seeing on our television screens about Sudan and about Khartoum, especially all the, the, the attempts have been made to take foreign nationals out of Khartoum. And uh, that's been very difficult for those involved in that process. There's still people left behind. And the Christian community in Khartoum is always in a difficult place and faces opposition. Uh, the Christians there are normally the poorest of the poor. So at a time like this, when people have to pay extra to get food or pay extra to get their... Um, medicines and so on, the Christians can't afford to do that. And so once again, they are being oppressed because of the fact that they are believers in Christ. They can't get good jobs because they're Christians. And so they get the poorest jobs if they get jobs at all. And so that's, they ask us to pray for them at this difficult time. So these are different things right across our island and across the world. And we want to remember your own concerns here as well. So join with me as we pray. Lord, we know it's good for us to remind ourselves that the church is much bigger than us just meeting here in our place today. There are churches right across this island, across these islands, and again, right across the world, worshipping today. Some of them in places of safety and security like us, others in places where it's really difficult. 
But first of all, Lord, we think of some churches across our island. We thank you for recent growth in the church in Dundalk and for all the, the different plans they have to outreach into the community. We pray for them, Lord, as they plan for a Christianity Explored course and as they, they like many places, have plans for uh, a summer holiday Bible club for the children. Thank you for those who are keen to do these things and we pray that you bless that work that the kingdom of Christ might continue to advance. We think too of Arklo and all the work that goes on there with children right throughout the year and we know that they're thinking especially about their holiday Bible club and so we pray that they'll be able to get all the volunteers they, they need and that all the plans will be made well and we pray that through the sowing of the seed of your word into the lives of young people there might be a harvest in times to come. And then we think of those tiny little congregations in Wexford and Enniscorthy. You can hardly imagine what it's like to have such a small number of people meeting for worship on a Sunday. And yet the faithful people want to do that. And they're fearful about the future. They know they're realistic. They realize that this situation will have to change. And so we pray that you give guidance to the convener of their vacancy and to all those who'll be involved in making decisions about their future. Even as we here in this place would look for help as we seek uh, for ministry here in these two congregations in the future. And we cry out to you for the help we need in our different situations, for guidance and for grace. And Lord, we thank you for Kenny Hanna's work in Hilltown twice a month. Thank you for the people who gather into the Bible study. He's encouraged and we pray that he'll be encouraged even more as others join with them. And also this new venture uh, there in Mailbridge uh, and we pray that Seamus will be much encouraged as more people are drawn into that we thank you that people have this hunger in their hearts for God that they want to know the truth and we pray that as they study the Bible together people might be convinced that Jesus is the answer to their need we think of Mexico we may have been there on, hosp on holiday but that's very different from living there and living under the shadow of the drug lords the gangs who dominate so much of life. And we understand that Christians are often targeted because of their stand against the drug barons and the gangs. So Lord, be with those, particularly leaders of churches who often are targeted. We pray that you give them courage and strength to face that opposition and to show the love of Christ even as they face the hatred of their enemies. And Lord, again, we think about Sudan. We've seen the pictures on our television screens, the violence, the bloodshed, the heartache, the fear. We thank you that many people have been able to leave the city, but we realise that many are left behind and that many of the Christian people, a tiny proportion of the congregation, are fearful for themselves, for their future. We pray, Lord, that they may know that you're there with them in this time of trouble. We pray that soon there might be some agreement among the warring factions for a peaceful solution to that need that there is in the land just now. We pray for those who are involved in trying to bring the sides together for those peace talks. And then, Lord, we don't forget our own local needs as well, the needs of these congregations. We remember those who have been bereaved in recent times, those who are in hospital, those who are not well at home, those who are fearful about the future, those who are older now and no longer able to come out to church on a Sunday. Those who have problems in their homes and families. Lord, we've just been singing about how we can run to Jesus in our times of need. And so we pray that as people in need do that, they'll find that your God is gracious and kind and will give them your grace to meet their needs. So Lord, hear all our prayers. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I don't know whether you follow events in the Houses of Parliament, but if you do, <clears throat> you'll know that every Wednesday, <clears throat> excuse me, at midday, uh, the House of Commons has Prime Minister's Question Time. And, you know, one by one, MPs are asked to stand up. The Speaker of the House identifies this one and that one. They stand up. They ask their questions. Sometimes the questions are very straightforward questions. When is this happening? Where are you going to be? Where, what, when? Those sorts of questions. Other questions, probably the majority of questions, are designed to be uh, trick questions, uh, designed to 
trick the Prime Minister to find him out and, uh, and to make everybody laugh at what he's saying. So that's what happens. In the passage that we read today, in John chapter 6, we, we see Jesus facing a kind of question and answer session. And, and as we'll discover, most of his answers were unexpected answers to the questions that he was asked. And his answers actually became very significant statements about deep spiritual truths. So let's see what we can learn as we look through this passage together. And here's the first heading, the work that we must do, reading uh, from verse uh, 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So the first question was asked with a very simple question. Uh, Rabbi, when did you get here? The crowd had been in search for Jesus on the shore of, of the Sea of Galilee. They hadn't found him. The disciples had crossed on a the boat. They knew Jesus hadn't been in the boat. So where was Jesus? He wasn't here. And then they went over to Capernaum, east to west. And they found Jesus there. They didn't know how he got, got there. Didn't know about him walking on the water to the disciples on the boat. And so they're asking this basic question, when did you get here? And so they wanted an answer to a very simple question. Jesus' answer to their question, however, doesn't tell them what they want to know. Instead of a direct answer to their question, he gives them a rebuke. I know that you're looking for me. You just want to see more miracles. You want me to feed you again, just as I did with the crowd and the five loaves and the two fish. You haven't understood that I'm a different kind of Messiah from the Messiah that you're looking for. Then he made that statement about what's more important than bread and fish. Stop thinking about food for your stomachs, which can't meet your deepest needs. Search for spiritual food, food that has lasting value, the kind of spiritual food that only I can give you, the food that endures to eternal life. And he said, remember, God the Father points to me through the Old Testament scriptures, through the testimony of John the Baptist, for example, through my miracles. The Father testifies to me that I am the answer to your spiritual hunger. And he says, work for food that endures. Which drew a second question, a very important question. What must we do to do the works God requires? To which Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent into the world. And that is an answer I think that can confuse some people reading it today. Doesn't the New Testament say that salvation is by grace and not by works? So why does Jesus talk about faith as being a work? Well, I think there are a couple of things we can say about that. The first is this, that yes, it's true. Salvation is entirely by grace. There, there's nothing that we can do or ever will do to deserve God's salvation. It is a gift from God. From the very first chapter in, in, in John's gospel, this, this idea comes across indeed from the very first chapter in verses 12 and 13. We read this, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The fact is that salvation is a gift of grace. But that doesn't rule out the idea that God requires us to exercise faith. That is the work that God requires, the effort that God looks for to exercise faith in the one that he has given. One of the commentators uh, gives this illustration. The roots of a tall oak tree perform a well-nigh unbelievable amount of work in drawing water and minerals from the soil to serve as nourishment for the tree. Nevertheless, these roots do not themselves produce these necessities, but receive them as a gift. Similarly, the work of faith is the work of receiving the gift of God. 
So in order to be doing what God requires, we need to exercise saving faith. And that faith has to be in Jesus Christ alone. No one else, nothing else. That is the message that we need to hear, that our communities need to hear, that our world needs to hear. Salvation is by grace alone in Christ alone. I read this wee story in the magazine recently. When Mount Vesuvius erupted in AD 79, its volcanic activity left a treasure trove of uniquely preserved artifacts. There's been an exhibition that's been touring the world of more than 500 uh, objects. Most of what goes on display has been excavated in the last 25, 30 years or so. Pompeii was a port city of nearly 20,000 people when Vesuvius erupted. Archaeologists found victims surrounded by objects with which they tried to escape. Items like jewellery, gold, armour, table silver and medical tools were common. One woman, though, was found clutching a silver and gold statuette of Mercury, the god of safe passage. What a tragic irony, says the writer. The value of faith is not that we have it, but that we have placed it in the right God. It is faith in Jesus Christ alone that saves from sin. All other faith is misplaced. And I hope we all understand that faith in Christ alone is what saves. Second thought that comes across in the passage is the bread of life that we must take. Reading again at verse 30. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, you would have thought that these people had seen enough miraculous signs already from Jesus. He'd been performing miracles of healing and, and different things, even walking the wall. They hadn't seen it, but Jesus had been performing miracles. You'd have thought they'd seen enough. And only the day before, Jesus had multiplied the the five loaves and the the two fish for this crowd of over 5,000 people. What a miracle. But then we get another insight into their thinking with this reference to the Old Testament manna. It seems that they were saying something like this. If you, Jesus, are greater than Moses, then perform a greater sign than him. He gave our forefathers bread from heaven. Yet, yes, you did multiply the loaves, But you had bread in your hands to start with when you broke it and made more bread, bread from bread. Moses didn't do that. He gave us bread straight from heaven. That's better than your miracle. So how did Jesus answer? Jesus said to them, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Yes, Moses was God's agent in in those wilderness wanderings, leading the people through the desert. And yes, he was the one who gave the instructions about how the manna would be collected day by day. But he didn't actually provide the bread. It came miraculously from heaven. He didn't touch it. And as you know, Jesus saying, saying to them, that, hand, that manna really is a picture pointing to me. It's only a picture of the real bread that, that God wants to provide for you. That bread is me. I am the one who has come down from heaven into this world to give spiritual life and strength to all who would receive me gladly. This life, this spiritual life, is for the whole world. He gives life to the world. And you're a Jew listening to Jesus speaking, and you wouldn't like that. You think, the Messiah is just coming for the Jews, to bless the Jews. Jesus is saying, this bread that's come from heaven is for the whole world. So they, they didn't understand this. And anyway, they were thinking about earthly bread. They were thinking about barley loaves. They were thinking, maybe if we kept on taking these barley loaves, that would be enough. Keep on giving us the barley loaves. They must have some kind of magical properties. From Sir, sir from now on, give us this bread that endures. To which Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. And this, of course, is, um, is, is the first of the I am sayings of Jesus in John's gospel. Every time Jesus said, I am something, he was saying, I am God. Using different illustrations, but I am God. 
Just like the God who revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, the I am God. I am God. I'm the bread of life. I'm the one who's been sent by the Father to meet your spiritual needs. I am the answer to your hunger and thirst. When you believe that, and when you come to me, your hunger and your thirst for God will be satisfied. You will know God as you've never known him before. You'll know peace as you've never known it before. You will experience life as you've never known it before. Life in all its fullness. But then Jesus went on to say, you have seen me and heard me and still you do not believe. And that was a tragedy back then that the people saw Jesus' miracles, they heard Jesus' teaching, but so many of them just went in one ear and out the other ear. And if that was true then, it's still true, of course, today. There's so many people who have heard the message, who know the truth, grown up through Sunday school and church and all of that. They know in their heads the truth, the message, but they don't believe it personally. They're familiar with the name of Jesus, and yet they do not believe that they need him, the one that they've been taught about. How sad that was back then, how sad it still is today. I read this the other day. In the Antarctic summer of 1908-09, Sir Ernest Shackleton, familiar name, and three companions attempted to travel to the South Pole from their winter quarters. They set off with their four ponies to help carry their load. Weeks later, their ponies were dead, their rations were all but exhausted. They turned back towards their base, their goal not accomplished. Altogether, they trekked for 127 days. On that return journey, Shackleton recorded in his notes, the time was spent talking about food, what they didn't have, elaborate feasts, gourmet delights, sumptuous menus, as they staggered along, suffering from hunger, from dysentery, not knowing whether they would survive, every waking hour was occupied with thoughts of eating. They longed for food. When there was no food, they were tortured by that thought of food that wasn't there for them. But how different for those who have spiritual hunger today? The food is there, always, in every place. Jesus, the bread of life. That's why, for for example, today, as, as you hear about what's happening in our world, many Muslim people are turning to Jesus. They've tried Islam, found it doesn't satisfy their spiritual needs. They hear about Jesus, who's read read about in the Quran. They want to know more about Jesus. And when they know more about Jesus, they say, this is the one that we need. He's the missing one. Jesus is indeed the Savior and Lord whom we need. That's why many Muslims are, are turning to him. And it's a wonderful thing that's happening in our world today. Their hearts are empty. And they find that Jesus is the one who satisfies them. But it's true all around us. There are people who have a hunger for God. They don't know it very often. And so they try to fill their lives with all kinds of stuff. Just like the fake bread. They're looking for this, that, and the other thing to fill their lives. And they don't realize what they need. Their deepest need is to know God and to know Jesus in their life. You know, the sad thing is that in church buildings like this, all up and down our country, there are people sitting in pews today who are people like that a hunger for God that is still not met because they haven't opened their heart and life to Jesus. For those of us who are Christians already, we need to be praying that God will, will, will open people's eyes to see that that is their need, their, their, their deepest need. The most important thing about their life, God created them in his image to have a relationship with him and when they don't have that relationship, there's something basically missing and always will be until they find that need met in Jesus. So there is the work that we must do. We must exercise saving faith in Christ. There is the bread that we must take. That is Jesus, the bread and life. And there's the hope, thirdly, that we can have. All that the Father gives me, said Jesus, will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The hope that we can have. 
Hope for every penitent sinner. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Whoever they are, whatever they have been in life, whatever they've done in life, whoever comes to me, if they're an honest seeker, if they're genuine about turning from their sinful life to me, then that person will never be turned away. The bread is there for all the hungry. Whoever comes, we come to Christ and we are made new by him. And that provides hope for us in this life. Here's the Lord's promise. I shall lose none of all the Father has given me. It's his promise. Once we genuinely come to him, trust in him, then we cannot be lost. We accept him as our Lord. We find safety and security. His stamp of ownership is upon our life. We may stray. We may backslide for a time, but we cannot be lost. Hope for every believer in this life. And hope for the future as well. Look at that verse 40 again. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. In Christ, our future is secure. It is guaranteed. He will take us through the valley of the shadow of death to be in the house of the Lord forever. So it's the best of both worlds. Hope for this life now, knowing the forgiveness of God, peace with God, having the help of God in our lives, grace for our everyday journey. And hope beyond this life. Hope beyond the grave, the hope of heaven. I shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. There's a story about the the French philosopher uh, Francois Rabelais. He lived back in in, in the 1500s. And his final words, his final words and final dying breath in in 1553 were these. They were recorded for him. I am going to the great perhaps. The great perhaps. He didn't know. He had no faith. Maybe there's something, maybe there's not. I'm going to the great perhaps. Compare that with Jesus' words to the thief dying beside beside him on the cross. He didn't talk about perhaps. He said, today, because you have repented and believed, today you will be with me in paradise. No perhaps, certainly. And that's what it is for believers today and in every age. Hope for every penitent sinner. If we genuinely come to him, he receives us. He won't turn us away. Hope for this life. Once we are in his hands, we cannot be taken out of his hands. No one can take you out of my hand, Jesus said to his disciples. And hope for the future as well. When eventually our earthly remains are led to rest, that's all they are, earthly remains, our spirit goes to be with the Lord. Awaiting that day of resurrection, I will raise him up at the last day. And so death, yes, it's painful. It takes loved ones from us, of course it does. And there's a pain that's there. But death does not have the final say. For believers, there is that hope of everlasting life. We trust in the one who has conquered death. We trust in the one who is the bread of life. So yes, bread is important to us. We probably eat it every day of our lives. Maybe toast for our breakfast. Maybe our sandwiches at lunchtime. Maybe something later on in the day. Bread is important. But nothing is as important as as the bread of life. Jesus, the bread that has come from heaven, the one who came to be our Saviour and Lord. May our trust be in him. Whether we're children, teenagers, young married couples, older folk, senior citizens, we all need the bread of life. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus into the world to be the bread of life, the one who fills that emptiness in life, that need for God that we have. We thank you for all those I am sayings that remind us that Jesus came to reveal God to us and to be God in us as well by his spirit. We pray that you'd help us by your grace to open our hearts and lives to him, that our hunger might be satisfied that all our needs be met in him and that we might have that hope for the grave beyond the grave as well. 
Thank you that Jesus is the one who died for sinners like us, rose again from the dead, has gone to heaven to prepare a place for his people. So may that hope be real for each of us. And may Jesus now and always be the bread of life to us. For we ask these things in his name. Amen. And so, so we come to our closing item of praise, entitled Cornerstone, from one of these hill song and um, worship songs from Australia. Um, reminds us, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's a different picture. Jesus here is the cornerstone on whom we build our lives, as well as being the bread of life who fills our emptiness. But it reminds us how important Jesus is to us. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.